let me begin. Uh, thanks for uh, thanks for the nice introduction, Renji. Uh, and also thank you to all the all the part, all the all the audience for joining us for the second session. Uh, my name is Sung Ah Lee. I'm an assistant professor at the uh, Department of Electrical Engineering at Yonsei University. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about another um, quantitative phase imaging modality called uh, Fourier tachography. So we've heard a lot about QPI imaging um, in the first uh, session of this workshop. So I hope most of us are quite familiar with it by now. Um, in fact, um, I will actually uh, talk about Fourier tachography, which is, a, which is an alternative way of measuring phase information <clears throat> other than using uh, interferometric measurement. And, um, uh, and we are quite interested in uh, using Fourier tachography to build uh, low cost and high throughput imaging systems for various imaging applications. So I believe uh, some of us here are quite familiar with FPM. Uh, some of you might be experts in XP FPM already. Um, and, <clears throat> uh, and also some of us, uh, some, of the, some of the audience might not be familiar with FPM. So I think I'm going to spend uh, quite a bit of my presentation trying to um, uh, basically introduce what FPM is, uh, explain what it is. And, and then uh, in the later part of the talk, I will talk about some of the um, developments in our lab, trying to use um, different light sources for FPM, uh, trying to make uh, smaller and lower cost uh, imaging systems using FPM and also using uh, smartphone devices. Okay, uh, that let me uh, first start with the concept of the space bandwidth product of an imaging system. So in a given imaging system, for example, if it's a microscope, you either have to choose um, between imaging a small field of view with a very high resolution or imaging a large field of view with low resolution. So this, uh, this trade-off between the resolution and the field of view is, uh, is inherent, and it actually becomes increasingly expensive and difficult to improve both the resolution and the field of view in a given imaging system. Um, so we refer to this, uh, this trade-off basically as the space bandwidth product of an imaging system. And the definition of the space bandwidth product basically is the multiplication between the field of view seen in the space domain and, and the bandwidth of your images uh, seen in the uh, spatial frequency domain or the inverse of the resolution. So by this definition, the space bandwidth product is effectively a, uh, is, is, is basically an effective number, number of uh, number of effective pixels in your images. Uh, if you divide your entire field of view, the area of your field of view by the by your optical resolution, the the number of pixels that you actually get, that's the definition of space bandwidth, and that actually tells us about how much information content that your imaging system can effectively measure. So, for example, in uh, typical microscopes, this space bandwidth product is limited by the microscope objectives. And to give some uh, typical numbers, these uh, microscope objectives, typically they have about 10 to 30 megapixels of the space bandwidth product. And also in comparison, uh, the image sensors that we use recently, uh, especially in the, in, in the, in the modern cameras that go in uh, modern mobile devices, they actually come with very high pixel count, ranging from few megapixels to few tens of megapixels. And in fact, uh, they actually go above uh, 100 megapixels these days. So these are the typical numbers for um, the available space bandwidth product in uh, typical imaging systems that we use. Uh, so this also 
So means that if you want to go above this SBP and measure more information from a given imaging system, we actually need to take a dif different approach. And one of those approaches in increasing the space bandwidth product, uh, and also the most common way of increasing the space bandwidth products in a microscope is to, uh, is to move the sample around and scan different field of view and stitch the entire images. So this is basically what most of us are doing. Um, if you just have a decent uh, mechanical stage that can move your sample at a, you know, at a precise step size, then you can uh, take multiple images, stitch them together, and they, that basically improves your field of view with a uh, given uh, resolution. However, these uh, conventional high NA microscopes actually have to use expensive optics. Uh, the stage it also is very big and heavy. Um, it, it has to be pretty decent. Um, and, um, and then uh, about seven, eight years ago, there's another idea of computational microscope called uh, Fourier Tychography Microscopy has been has been uh, has been invented. This was uh, first demonstrated, uh, first proposed and demonstrated uh, from Chang He Yang's group uh, by Guan Zhang and in 2013. Uh, here, the basic idea is that we stick with the very low magnification, low NA objective lens for imaging, but uh, we also keep uh, we we basically take multiple images with different illumination angles and then try to combine the different information in those multiple low resolution images and improve the final image resolution. And that basically also improves the uh, space bandwidth products of the overall images. And also it turns out that during this uh, image reconstruction process, we actually have to recover both the amplitude and phase information of the sample which is uh, why FPM actually can achieve uh, quantitative phase imaging uh, through this uh, computational reconstruction. Uh, so the working principles of the FPM is as follows. Uh, so again, the imaging hardware is very simple. It's just a conventional microscope. All we need to do is to replace the illumination with an array of LEDs a simple LED, two-dimensional matrix of this LED. And we take multiple LEDs while turning each LED on at a time in this LED array. And what happens is that <clears throat> um, <clears throat> by scanning the angle of illumination, we basically get to scan the, uh, scan the sample, uh, uh, scan the angular spectrum of the transmitted light through the sample. Uh, around the imaging system. And that is equivalent as, uh, as moving the lens around to collect multiple images over the very large angular substance of your imaging system. So combining those information effectively works as increasing the effective numerical aperture of your imaging system. And that's why, that's why the final resolution is getting improved. So each of these uh, low resolution images that are acquired by the, by the camera in the microscope actually corresponds to a uh, different region in the Fourier space of your, uh, of your original images. And the reconstruction basically works uh, by stitching those uh, information in the Fourier space. Uh, which corresponds to the position, uh, which corresponds to the shift in the Fourier space that, that comes from the position of the LEDs and the angle of illumination at that specific location. And then after taking about uh, more than 50 to uh, about 100 images, and the final uh, Fourier spectrum is, wide, uh, is now much wider than the original low resolution image that you started with. And, and if you take inverse Fourier transform of this Fourier spectrum, you're, you, will, um, you will get a much higher resolution images. Um, if we put this uh, reconstruction process in more detail, if we try to describe this in reconstruction process in more detail, we actually model the sample 
as a thin layer of uh, thin layer having a complex transmittance. And this complex transmittance actually has both the amplitude and the phase term. And we learned that in, uh, through the morning session that this uh, amplitude term of the transmittance actually corresponds to the absorption of uh, absorption that happens in the sample. And the phase term corresponds to the phase delay, which is attributed to the refractive index uh, distribution and also the thickness distribution of your sample. So by modeling this uh, complex transmittance of the sample, whenever we uh, illuminate the sample with LEDs coming in at a different angle, uh, this can be modeled as this uh, plane wave with different K vector. This is equivalent to shifting the object's Fourier uh, uh, object's uh, spectrum in the Fourier space. And then we know, uh, if we know the imaging system's transfer function, which is the complex pupil function of the imaging system, we can model the low resolution image using this uh, simple Fourier transform operation uh, where we, we record the amplitude, sorry, the intensity of the field uh, in this uh, imaging system. And then once we model this as a as this forward problem, uh, we can also construct an inverse problem where we try to find the object's uh, complex transmittance, which minimizes the difference between our measurement and the calculated um, low resolution images. And uh, by computing this, the gradient of this uh, function, we can, uh, we can update, we can iteratively update starting from a guess of our object. We can iteratively update the object's information after uh, through each iteration. And then algorithm basically converges to the right answer for both amplitude and phase term of the, of the object. Um, and the nice thing is that during this process, um, we actually don't have to have a very good idea of what this uh, pupil function actually has to be. Uh, just knowing the amplitude term of this pupil function is sometimes good enough. And in fact, we can jointly optimize for both the object, object's complex transmittance and also the, uh, also the pupil function at the same time and come up. Uh, and then the algorithm actually gives us the phase profile of the pupil function, which, which corresponds to the aberrations, optical aberrations in the imaging system. And, uh, and with that, the recovered images actually are aberration corrected images, which actually gives us much higher resolution in the images uh, compared to reconstruction without uh, aberration correction. So all of these methods actually were developed uh, on, uh, since the invention of FPM in 2013. Uh, these papers have been uh, a lot of, <clears throat> Many papers have been published by many different groups all over the world on uh, different algorithms, different approaches, and different hardwares to construct these uh, FPM imaging. And we are, uh, our group is also working on it. And here's some of our results, uh, very typical. Uh, we start with a very low magnification objective lens with very low NA, which gives us very low, resol low resolution in the original images. But after taking about 100 of these images and putting into our FPM reconstruction algorithm, we get to um, obtain much higher resolution in the final image with the synthetic numerical aperture of more than 0.5. And we can actually uh, improve this uh, numerical aperture. This, the synthetic numerical aperture is basically determined by the, your imaging objective lenses of aperture, uh, sorry, numerical aperture, and also the maximum angle of illumination that you use in your illumination system. Um, here's another uh, sample of a histology slide that we image with our system because we're using very low magnification objective lens. Our field of view is very large. I think uh, I think few millimeters in this specific case, but the resolution that we get to achieve is comparable to other uh, uh, to a 20x objective micro. Uh, microscope objective. And actually we can go further uh, beyond this numerical aperture. 
and resolution. And like I said earlier, we can reconstruct a complex phase profile of uh, biological samples. And the nice thing is that we can do this over a very large field of view. So in this particular case, the entire field of view was about four, four to five millimeters. And this is a blood smear imaged over four to five millimeters. We don't need to scan the sample around. We just need to, this is the, uh, this is the original field of view. We just need to stick the sample inside the microscope and take about 100 images while we switch the LEDs on and off. Um, another uh, sample, a uh, biological sample of uh, live cells. So again, this is the entire field of view about, of about three to four millimeters of uh, cells cultured in a dish. We can image them uh, all at the same time and recover their face information in high resolution. And because this, uh, again, another view of the same data. Uh, again, uh, these cells are not stained. So if you observe the raw bright field images, uh, the original uh, low resolution images, it's very hard to distinguish the uh, subcellular structures, but after FPM reconstruction, you can see uh, these, uh, uh, these uh, different structures inside the cell. And again, uh, this image acquisition, we take about uh, 70 to 100 images to recover these images. And depending on the hardware setup that you use, um, at most your cameras can take about uh, between 20 to 30 frames per second, if it's a regular, regular video rate camera. And th which means that we can go up to maybe uh, taking uh, so, so taking about 100 images at best would take uh, about three to four seconds, right? Um, so that's the uh, that's sort of the upper limit of the image acquisition speed. Um, right now, our light source isn't super bright, so we actually have to integrate for quite a bit of time in between each frame. So it takes about 20 seconds to capture one set of data. And we kind of, we basically put the entire thing in a microscope, uh, sorry, in a cell incubator and observed live cell, uh, performed live cell imaging uh, using FPM device over two to three days. And these are the videos created from that experiment. So you can see the cells moving around. This is just a portion of the entire field of view. So we can actually image uh, hundreds and thousands of cells at a single capture. So this can be a very high throughput microscopy if you want to do any sort of cell-based uh, analysis or cell-based assays. Um, as I briefly mentioned before, uh, the acquisition speed and um, the uh, and the reconstruction quality actually quite depends a lot on how well the illumination, uh, how well the in, uh, how how. How the image, how the sample is illuminated. So in uh, in in FPM, uh, many different groups came up with different illuminator designs to uh, to make FP FPM reconstruction more robust. So starting with very simple um, uh, commercial LED matrix. Uh, some people also try to create these uh, dome LED array in uh, such that the high NA uh, LEDs coming in at a very high illumination angle would also be as bright as possible. Excuse me. Sorry, that can me. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> and also different designs like these uh, annular arrays of LED rings were also introduced. And um, so with all these different illuminator designs, we actually thought about um, why can't we just use an OLED display uh, and each pixel of the OLED display as an illuminator for Fourier tachography. 
Uh, the nice thing here is that OLED display has much higher contrast than other types of arrays for, for it, uh, other types of display devices like LCD. And uh, since the pixels are so small and there are so many pixels to work with, we can actually arrange these uh, illuminator pixels in different configurations. Uh, we can also vary the sizes of these uh, dots, uh, move them around and also multiplex them, also use different colors at the same time. Um, so in, in this approach, uh, there's actually two things we need to think about in terms of uh, choosing the illuminators for, for free tachography. So first requirement is the spatial coherence of the light source. So FPM actually assumes that the, uh, the illumination is spatially coherent, which means that the angular substance coming from a finite sized mm, light source actually have to be quite much, much smaller than the numerical aperture of the, imaging, uh, of, of the imaging objective lens. Which means that if I have a certain pixel size in my LED array or even in the OLED dis, uh, display, uh, the sample to illumination distance actually has to be uh, of certain distance in order for this angle to be small enough. So choosing this uh, sample to object distance is one criteria. And another is that when, um, when we are performing image reconstruction, we actually chop up the entire field of view into smaller region of, re uh, region of interest and perform phase retrieval within those uh, smaller region of interest. But, the, uh, but here the assumption is that within the region of interest, we assume that the illumination has a same single K vector, which means that the angle, the, the difference in the angle uh, at one end of the ROI and the other end ha actually has to be quite small. And this also has to be, has to do with the height of the, uh, the separation between the sample to illumination and also the size of the ROI length. So if we actually can decrease the sample to illumination distance using small pixel size of the OLED screens, then we also actually have to choose a smaller ROI size in order for FP reconstruction to work. So we, we checked these two criteria for our OLED screen illumination. Uh, and um, well, what's nice here is that the illumination pixel size for most of the modern OLED screens is very small. Um, maybe less than about 50 microns. Uh, this means that we can actually work with very, very small sample to illumination distance, which is in the order of millimeters, which is basically like putting the sample directly on top of the screen, uh, slide glass on top of the screen. Um, but then uh, two problems emerge in terms of the size of the ROIs actually have to be pretty small. And also uh, because uh, these, uh, these OLED pixels also have very smaller angular uh, field of view, uh, if you just turn on one pixel, only a small part of the entire field of view will be illuminated. So the imaging field of view actually is much greater than the illumination field of view of a single pixel. Um, so, uh, so but these problems can be addressed um, that uh, because our field of view is much greater, uh, we can actually calculate the K vector differences be, uh, uh, depending on the location of the sample that we are imaging. So this can all be basically just a simple arithmetics. We can calculate the K vector under a given LED uh, or a given position of the illumination. And also because if uh, the imaging field of view is greater than the illumination field of view, we can basically just turn on a multiple pixels of the screens on at the same time and take images so that the entire images are illuminated at the same, entire field of view is illuminated at the same time. Um, but, but in this case, what we need to consider is that at a given point, given position on the sample, uh, there is more than one um, illumination coming from a multiple of these pixels, which means that we actually have to consider multiple K vectors 
uh, eliminating at the same time in uh, during the reconstruction process. But this problem actually has been solved. So we, we took the same kind of approach to solve that problem. Uh, so here are some of our preliminary results. Uh, if we just uh, turn on, or if we just place our sample directly on the LED array and image them with a regular microscope and move the LED, uh, so sorry, OLED pixel around, it's just the this smartphone display screen, then this uh, bright field of view region actually moves around with the illumination. Uh, and after, uh, after FP reconstruction, we get to see the phase profile of a blood smear like this. Uh, but because, uh, because of the limited field of view, only the center of the field of view is correctly um, recovered, whereas the outer field of view basically has no information. Uh, we can also just turn on multiple array of pixels, in which case uh, our low resolution image basically looks like this where this uh, grid pattern actually moving around as we move these um, array of dots around. And then uh, performing uh, phase retrieval, we can recover the images over the entire field of view uh, with decent quality uh, over the, both at the center and the edge of the field of view. And the phase profile actually looks uh, similar to what we would expect from blood smears. Uh, but again, because uh, in, in the second case, because we have to, um, we have to consider multiple K vectors illuminating the same, same uh, sample spot in single, single measurements, it's actually a harder problem than the first case. Uh, and we realized that it, has, it actually has to be recovered with much more number of low resolution measurements because uh, the images are kind of multiplex, which is something that we're working on currently. Uh, so because we saw that, since we saw this uh, OLED display can be a decent illumination for FPM, we went on and uh, further tried to reduce the entire footprint of the microscope uh, based on this FPM principle. So here again, um, basically the motivation is very simple. We use microscopes a lot, but it's very tough to carry this microscope outside of the lab if uh, if we have to carry them to the field and perform some sort of field, image-based field diagnostics. Uh, it's a very heavy equipment. Uh, you need some sort of uh, desk and a, and a trained professional to operate these uh, microscopes. Um, however, uh, we thought that since we are so familiar with, um, uh, since everyone now has mobile devices and these mobile devices come with very high quality cameras, very uh, multiple image sensors and high quality optics, as well as uh, very high performance pro processors that are very efficient in dealing with images. We thought that maybe we can combine, we can, we can take advantage of these mobile devices and trying to build very high performance portable microscopes on smartphones. And actually this idea, we're not the first ones to think about this. This idea has been around for a long time, uh, starting uh, in the early 2000s. Um, people try to put uh, mobile phones uh, in the eyepiece of a regular microscope to obtain digital images in a portable device format. And then people could quickly realize that these cameras aren't really designed perfectly for imaging uh, of looking into a microscope, which is why there's always this uh, limited field of view that we get. So other than uh, using a regular, op uh, regular microscope optics, why not use a uh, very small mobile, <clears throat> excuse me, small um, lens modules to match the pupils of the camera, camera lens and this lens module so that we, get, we can take advantage of the entire field of view of the lens but still the images weren't very high quality enough. And, uh, and there has also been uh, different approaches where we take advantage of the image sensor, the high space bandwidth product image sensors that are already in these mobile devices, but maybe um, not so much the lenses. So groups like uh, Oscan group at UCLA and Chang He Yang's group at Caltech, uh, there's been a few different approaches to modify these cameras and perform lensless imaging, like uh, shadow imaging or digital inline holography to uh, obtain very high space bandwidth products 
high resolution and large field of view images of biological samples for field diagnostic applications. And more recently, there's also been some approaches where uh, these, these um, um, complex illumination-based computational microscopes to be uh, applied to uh, these mobile devices. But again, uh, in order for these uh, computational microscopes to work in these devices, uh, the, uh, it actually has to come with very complicated and bulky illuminator design. Uh, and also uh, still very hard to match the design to maximize, to, to utilize the full field of view of these uh, image sensors in these case, cases. So with that, uh, since FPM is such a flexible um, and very simple and straightforward design, why not, why not make everything, uh, why not make FPM completely standalone just using the smartphone. So if we can use the screen of the uh, smartphone as, a, as an illumination and the camera of the smartphone as part of the microscope, and if we can design the optics very well, then we can probably achieve very high space bandwidth products, a uh, smart microscope that runs completely on device uh, without any external light sources, any power sources or, um, or even modification of the device. So that was the basic idea here. So we designed a compact microscope optics um, to utilize, the, utilize both the front camera module and the screen. We had to put some mirrors here. And here the, um, we, we designed these optics using off-the-shelf uh, optical components. But here, the main idea here was that we use some field lenses to match the pupils of this entire microscope and this uh, tiny um, camera lens uh, that's used in the smartphone camera. So that if we match the pupils very well, then we can actually utilize the entire field of view of the microscope and use, uh, use the entire pixels of the image sensor in the camera, smartphone camera. Um, so here is how we designed the entire module. So this is just a 3D printed um, optical mount where we can place each of these uh, lens elements, assemble them together and just uh, slide in a smartphone device and, and a sample here. This is, the, uh, this is the assembled view of our prototype device. So it's very small and standalone. And then we built an app to acquire all the images and also uh, perform reconstructions on the smartphone device. Uh, in fact, these um, Fourier tachography reconstruction is basically iterations of uh, Fourier transforms, which is, uh, which is pretty fast to run. And then uh, even if our images are very large, the reconstruction actually is done in very smaller patches. So we chop up these images in smaller patches and run a Fourier transform for multiple iterations. And then recovered images can be uh, obtained in the device, uh, both the amplitude and phase information like this. So we checked the performance of our system. Uh, it works well with uh, the chiefs high enough resolution over the center and the edges of the field of view. Um, the phase images are not perfect, but we can actually reserve them very well. Uh, the phase reconstruction is especially difficult because this uh, miniature optics actually has a lot of optical aberrations. Um, it's very severe, but it still works to a certain level. These uh, biological objects um, can also be imaged. Uh, we can also do color imaging by uh, capturing three different images with both red, gre red, green, and red, red, green, and blue illuminations. Um, and then we compared our basic, uh, the space bandwidth product with other literatures, and we saw that uh, among the smartphone-based microscopes, our uh, space band final space bandwidth product, which is about 18 megapixels, is probably one of the largest uh, that's been achieved so far. Uh, and this, again, this number is comparable to the, uh, to the benchtop microscopes uh, with typical microscope objectives. So for the interest of time, I think I should end here. Um, 
Yeah, so, so far I talked about Fourier tachography microscopy and how to use a OLED screen for illumination and uh, our implementation of, of a mobile phone-based uh, FPM device. Uh, so thank you all for listening. Uh, this is our group. Uh, Kyung Cho here has done a lot of the work on FPM. Uh, Kyung Wan here and Jo here as well. Thank you. And let me know if you have any questions. <laughs>